We're back to some Super Mario Odyssey action with myself, Dangers, and Limcube here with me as well. And, you know, what do you have to say about that first one, Limcube? We've got some pretty spicy action right out of the gate. I was not expecting Chaos to pop off quite as good as he did in that first match. Absolutely. I was definitely expecting runners to be more affected by like a live scenario because, I mean, I'm not sure how good that comes off on stream, but people are obviously talking, people are playing games all around, and it's like definitely a different atmosphere than when you're at home. But let's see, we have Nicro Vida versus Stravos on right now. And actually, Nicro was on one of our GSA Rundown episodes telling us that he obviously had done a run at a GDQ event, and he also has been doing some melee tournaments back then, so he should be at least a, a kind of... He definitely was exposed to a crowd before, so we'll see if that's actually going to be an advantage for him. Stravos does seem pretty calm, does seem pretty collected, so I'm not sure if he's actually going to be affected by a live scenario. But what might actually be interesting is that Nicro actually tweeted out last week that he has been taking a little bit time off, off of the game because it seems like he might have actually been a little bit burnt out or something, and he hasn't actually played too much recently. So let's see how this is going to affect his race. That's right. Very interesting scenario from Nicro because he does have a little bit of experience playing in front of a live crowd, and GDQ in itself is a very a huge crowd. Um, so probably not having as much stage fright as the other runners. That being said, watching Stravos play live has been very fascinating. Oh, yeah. He's got a very calm demeanor about himself, and I, that you know that might actually com like come across, and you know he might be in the zone right now. We'll never know. All right, and here they are, Nick and Stravos here on our screen. We have we already updated the the bracket right here. Chaos leading this one now with 78 points. Curbs on 12 after that first um, game right here, and now it's obviously Nico versus Stravos on day one. Keep in mind, we will have three days of group stage matches, and then uh, depending on who's first and second, we'll have a big grand final to see who is going to be winning. Now let's look at these stats. Um, Average time looking pretty close, best time looking pretty close. Nigro actually overall, I think with the most solid stats, even though it might not look that way, uh, actually able to um, outstat Stravos in all of these uh, trick stats right here. Shouldn't matter too much. I, I, in my opinion, Stravos is one of the most consistent guys when it comes to all of these bigger tricks, such as Nutclap, at least from like, watching him. But Nigro, even uh, we might not actually have paid enough attention because these stats are looking very good. 100% Nutclap, 100% Snowdrum. He might not have the best time of the, the runners that exist here. You know, obviously little curbs popping off and getting that sub hour in a race. Stravos does have the best time up on the, sh on the screen here. But the average time really does matter because that is kind of what you have to look at when you consider how these guys are able to perform on a consistent basis, not to mention 100% nut clip, 100% snow dram. Those are the kinds of things that you look at for, you know, some very heavy time-saving tricks. And if, if the runners are going to miss those, they're going to be losing quite a lot of time. So when it comes to consistency, it looks like Nicro has the numbers, but Stravos is definitely the kind of player that, you know, in his very early career in Super Mario Odyssey, we used to peg him as the kind of guy who would be pushing these very optimal strategies, oh, yeah. and he'd be going all, all out to make sure that he was doing the absolute fast thing but as he's progressed as he's kind of moved into this race scenario he does have a couple of victories under his belt more because of his consistency level and he really does show that and especially lately and interestingly enough Strauss is actually the only player who currently does not go for lake clip being this very specific um, strat in lake we talked earlier we talked about earlier where you kind of clip through that corner and basically skip the boss efficiently so we might see a little bit of a route difference there also not completely sure about wooded i know nicro is going for the tree route and stravos is not going for that usually so we'll see if uh, that's actually gonna make a big difference in this race but we are off on to our second race of the day day one pace 2019 nicro reader versus stravos 96. Away they go. Now, it is kind of fascinating that you bring that up, that Stravos is one of the few runners in the league to go for this late clip, but still managed to make his way to the top four regardless of it. And I think that really goes to show that if you're looking into getting into a platforming speed game like this, movement is everything. You know, the tricks that we find, they might save time, but it's always kind of a definitive number of, of seconds that saves time. But just getting better at the game and putting your, your consistent practice into getting from A to B faster is really what's going to come down as saving you the most time at the end of the day. It's kind of a more generalized time save. And you, as you get better, you just, you just move faster. And that's what Stravos is all about. 
And here we go, Nycro, obviously the first guy to ever break the sub all barrier as far as their backgrounds go, but now we are on to our race. It looks like a pretty decent thing happening here at the very start. I think the main t difference in time right now is that Nycro is actually able to skip that first cutscene a little bit quicker. Not the very first one, but the one where you actually obtain control over Cappy. But right now, as they capture the frog, they're pretty much synced up. Perfect sync on the frog room here. Looks like Stravo's got a little bit of a cleaner line getting that frog. And uh, that strategy about vectors that we were talking about earlier really coming into play here. Stravo's taking a little bit more of an optimal line to get up to the top of this door here. And he's going to be taking a lead, going to left side. Yeah, left side, a big trick. We talked about this earlier. Looks like this time both of these runners are going to be able to get there, fighting Topper as soon as possible. And Nycro actually having a little bit of issues to skipping about skipping that cutscene. Strauss is known to usually have a good Topper. Uh, that's something that he holds uh, himself accountable for and is able to do the same here. Going to be going into Cascade Kingdom with a little bit of a lead, uh, but very close. Yeah, both of these guys showing off the very start here, the consistency level of both of these runners as they move on into Cascade. Things are going to get a little bit tricky here, though. Yeah. I am assuming that both of these guys are going to be going for the wall jumpless first moon skip again. There's different versions of actually skipping that first story moon, a pretty big version exclusive trick. The fastest way of doing that would be to do that without any wall jumps, just kind of squeeze yourself below that invisible wall on the optimal height, and I think that's what these guys are going to be going for. Yeah, an optimal trick. Obviously, if you've played this game before, the game kind of leads you into this very first moon hidden in that shiny rock to the right there. But we're just going to go ahead and jump right past it and on our way to the boss fight. Stravos looks like he didn't get quite the setup he was looking for, so he's going to have to take a wall jump and a ledge grab. But Nycro oh, actually taking bonk. a bonk in order to get up there. So not too much time lost on Stravos' part there as a result of that mistake from Nycro. Yeah, that's not the biggest issue, but obviously bombs being a little bit more painful than just a ledge grab, you still are able to grab yourself back up going towards that next section. But um, yeah, definitely a pretty big time loss there for Nick. And when I say pretty big, I'm talking about like two seconds, but these two seconds do matter in a race like this. These guys seem to be on a pretty um, even level right now. And Stravo's just messing up this fight a little bit here. It doesn't look like he's getting the optimal um, capture on what we call chain chompy kids right out of the gate. So he is going to have to reset this up and kind of be facing the opposite direction. But he does get a very fast capture on the second one. And it looks like we are essentially synced up as we Pretty finish nice this fight. Sure. Madabudel falling to the ground on almost the same frame. Let's actually see. This moon grab can be quite um, big, depending on how you grab it. And Strauss actually going for a roll into a roll cancel jump. Let's see if that actually did anything. Because it looked like Nick was barely ahead after the end of the fight. But let's see if Strauss' way of grabbing that moon might have helped a little bit. It looks like actually might have, because we are looking very, very close here on very, that fade Very, very tiny difference, yep. Looking like a pretty close sink here. All right, and Mario is back onto the mainland of Cascade Kingdom, and we are going to be heading towards these uh, two last moons. Danger's brought up in that first race, how these two moons, while only being single moons that you just like, kind of jump into, can be quite crucial. That first one, technically pretty easy. You have to move towards it fast, but that second moon is the one in the chest, and you want to get that moon clip to be able to cut out that detour ring. The way we grab it is we're trying to grab it and cap throw it exactly at the right moment, so we kind of clip through the ceiling. You can see that Nick actually missed the clip there, and is going to have to take a little bit of a backup to get out of the alcove. Meanwhile, Stravos did clip through the ceiling and avoided all of the ceiling collision and was able to just get right back up onto the stage in time. So he's going to be coming out of here with about a four second lead. And this is very interesting because Strauss actually opted to go for the safer version of the chest clip. I'm not sure if that was intentional, but he kind of positioned himself on top of the chest, took his time, backflipped into the moon, got the clip. Nick went for the fast version. If he had gotten it, he would have increased his lead, but he didn't. Looked like he wasn't too um, affected by this one looking at his player cam. Also, actually, what I just what I just found out, Nick is doing the what he likes to call the bus driver to do his spin throw. So he essentially drives the bus with his controller. That's he like, right. really swings his arms to get these spin throws in. And Pretty cool to see that. You know, so having the video feeds directly on the players in another situation, like for example, if you're playing a fighting game, obviously you're just seeing their facial expressions and that's fine, but there is another layer of it with a game like Super Mario Odyssey where a lot of the inputs are actually physical movements. Yeah. So it is kind of fun to watch this is these e guys. This baby. It is. It actually is. You know, getting your workout in while also speedrunning. It is the perfect combo. 
All right, let's head into stand. I actually didn't catch if anybody anybody got those fast action guide skips. We are talking about a second of potential si time save there, though, so nothing too major struggles. Um, says that he has a unique strategy to get this text skip a little bit more consistent, but shouldn't be the biggest deal. We are not going to be seeing any of these fancy late crate routes in this specific one uh, race again. I'm not. Ass I'm assuming we won't be seeing that at pace in general. It's such a risky stretch to save these extra four seconds. Looks like we won't opt for this. Because usually if you go for one of these route changes, there's at least a backup moon that you can get. But if you miss the birds on the late crate route, which is the more optimal version of the sand route, you will actually be losing tons of time. As Nick actually had a little bit of issues there, getting an angle towards that dune. Yes, that is correct. Now, talking to some of the racers before this match happened, there are a couple of them that do implement this late crate into their PB attempts, but of course, if something does go wrong, you can just hit the reset button and go back to the beginning. Chaos Pringle himself did say that he is probably not going to be attempting oh. any of those kinds of things. Meanwhile, they do have little, or sorry, Nicro Vita here messing up just on that icicle pillar. Gonna have to back it up a little bit. Yeah, so the reason this happened is because he wanted to go for a backflip, but apparently he still held forward as he basically approached that ice pillar, causing the game to give him a long jump instead. So a little bit of a backup there. As long as he's still able to get this capture warp right here, that shouldn't be the biggest time loss, but I saw the platform kind of moving in closely. He was still able to get that. That is crucial. And swing slip can definitely still change up the pace here in sand. Absolutely. Stravos going to be the first to approach it after grabbing this moon hidden in the ground. He will be on his way to the Sphinx Clip. And because they're not doing the late crate route, you have probably two or three attempts at the second one to kind of be in a good position still. But the first one, you're obviously going to be trying to get as fast as you possibly can. And Stravos nailing it on the first try. Yeah, very nicely done by Strafia, getting the first clip immediately. Let's see if Nick is going to be able to, uh, to do this as well. I know this used to be a trick he struggled with at some points, but he is able to get the first clip immediately. The second clip technically a little bit more crucial, but Strabos is actually going to be clipping back in here. This is not the biggest deal if you go for the double clip, swings clip route, what he just did, basically clipping into that section twice, because you can just take the pipe to get back on track. But if you, what runners used to do is just clipping into the swings once to get both of these moves, if you clip back in there, your first clip was essentially useless. That's so right. not the biggest deal for Straf. Yeah, and there is a bird cycle here, as we mentioned the first time. It just so happens that this bird cycle has quite a bit of leeway to it at this optimal level. So these guys can be kind of going through the stage and can probably waste about a second or two before that bird is beyond the place where we're going to be losing time. Yeah, and that little jump that Nicro is about to do right here and Stravos just did, it actually seems so natural to us right now. This is what we usually call the Jaxi skip, because the intended version of getting here is actually using um, like that ice cave to kind of get to the Jaxi ruin section. But uh, by doing that jump, you can skip out on that uh, completely, which is like a super huge uh, and unrewarding section because there's only one very slow moon in there. Yes, but it does make that treasure chest that we get oh, incredibly so fast. Cool. I'm not sure if you just caught what Stravos did there, but he actually took his time to spin pound, and on his spin pound jump, he did a spin throw to catch that bird. That looked so awesome. Actually, very flashy stuff from Stravos there. And as you can see, both of the birds in a very good position here as a result of that, wow. sec that very first try second clip. So both of these guys are showing phenomenal results coming out of Sand Kingdom here. Yeah, good stuff. Strauss is going to be able to get that one spin throw notes right here. Nick is going to have to do another spin throw. This, this loses just a little bit of time, not really crucial at all. It, these early game kingdoms have been optimized to a level where people care about every single small mistake, and it really sticks out because we've seen insane sand exits. Here we've seen sand exits as low as like a 54, 9 minutes and 54 seconds is what like the best sand fade out would look like, which is insane. But these guys phenomenal. are still coming pretty close to this. Strauss is looking almost at the same level that uh, Chaos's sand fader was earlier. He's going to be getting a 10-11. Chaos earlier, I think, got a 10-07. Oh, uh, but Nick, on the other hand, is going to be closer to Strav than Kerbs was to Chaos on his first race. So this is looking a lot closer as Nick gets a 22 here, 11 seconds apart, getting into, um, into Lake. And yeah, 11 seconds in the grand scheme of things, really not a lot of time at all especially coming into Lake Kingdom with the Lake Clip, especially going into Wooded Kingdom after that with the Nut Clip and any shenanigans that may go wrong in Wooded do lose you quite a bit of time. So this For race sure. is far from over. Stravos taking commanding lead so far. 
Yeah, absolutely. And let's see, this is when, I mean, we talked about this briefly at the start of this uh, specific race here. Strauss, I mean, as far as I know, I'm not sure if he added anything going into pace, is not going to be going for this lay clip right here and is instead going to be going for the original route where he's going to be fighting uh, Rango, the boss. But I mean, maybe he, he, he practiced that a little bit and is deciding to throw that in here for pace. Looks like he won't, going for his original strats, capturing the cheap sheet right here and he's going to be fighting Rango at the very end. So we are kind of uh, going to see a little bit of a live comparison. And if Nicro is able to set up his late clip here and get it on the first try, just a little bit of extra setup here, but does look like it's going to be good on the second setup. So he might just save a little bit of time over Stravos. Sure. It might be For a little sure. bit hard to tell because they will be diverging just a little bit in this kingdom. And it might even look like Stravos has a little bit of a lead coming into this next part, but the, it is very easy to kind of underestimate how long these boss fights take. The bosses themselves are rather quick. It's all of the cutscenes and all of the waiting that you have to do afterwards that can be quite a pain. Yeah, so keep in mind the lead that Strabo had going to, into this kingdom was around 11 seconds. We will be able to see how it is at the end of this. And then additionally to whatever it actually is, I, I feel like, did Nix forget to switch to Joycott? Oh no, he didn't. He just like he just didn't get this, the down throw which he was trying to get right there. But um, as this kingdom is ending, we'll see the difference between those guys. And then additionally, Nicrovita is going to be saving some extra time in Metro Kingdom, which is the next kingdom we will be using the warp ability. And the first time you use the warp ability to any checkpoint, Cappy is kind of talking to you, explaining to you how the warp warping in this game works. And since Nick already got that Cappy text out of the way, since he was warping here, Stravos is going to be doing that later. It's going to be getting the text there, and it's going to be losing around 1.5 seconds over Nick in Metro. That is right. So this late clip route on its own already saves a pretty significant chunk of time, but also kind of saves you a little bit extra for free later on. So you do see Stravos is going to be hitting the globe here, but yeah. Nick right on his tail. Perhaps after those mistakes of not getting the down throw and taking a little probably. bit of extra time yep. to do the late clip, probably did lose about the same amount of time that late clip would have saved. So we're probably still looking to be about 10 seconds apart here. Yeah, might even be a little bit more here. 13.07 fade out for Stravos here as he leaves Lake. Let's see what Nick is going to get. Looks like looks like a 17 or 18, so uh, around 10 seconds apart. But keep in mind, he is going to be getting that extra time save in Metro, so pretty much just broke even while making a little bit of mistakes. Yep, still making it just a little bit worth. And now it's Wooded time again. And we obviously talked about earlier how Wooded can be so so crucial for your overall race time. We haven't seen a missed nut clip yet, but I would be very surprised if over the entire event we wouldn't see anybody failing it. It would, I kind of, I guess, speak for these runners because this is still a very tight input and everybody has been taking a lot of practice to make this input as consistent as possible. Nut clip obviously being this clip through the wall using one of the moons that a nut spawns in. We will be reminding you when it comes up. Strava's not close enough to that shopkeeper to be able to talk to him. We like to go into first person while uh, talking to them. That cuts out some camera panning, but he was a little bit too far away. It really can't be understated how easy a lot of these things look when these guys do it, you know? At the top level, a lot of this stuff seems very intuitive and very, like, smooth and flowing, but really, when you get down to it and you try it for yourself, it is not quite as easy as it seems. So Strava's gonna be the first to approach this nut clip. Set up incredibly quick. That shadow looks good. He's gonna be through the wall. And so Strava's actually not going for the tree route here. We have kind of a two and two split from the runners. So we're gonna see Nick go instead to the top of this tree and get this moon, meaning he'll skip the story moon later. So it looks like Stravos has quite a bit more of a commanding lead than he potentially does. Nick is going to be saving a little bit of time by going for the more risky but faster strat here. Yeah, and overall in this wooded so far, it looks like Nick is making up quite a bit of time because not only did he get a better first person talking to the shopkeeper, but also did he get a very fancy uh, section there with the output, was able to get uh, a lot of speed, is also able to get that nightclub almost clipping back and bounce. That was <laughs> insanely close. He's, he's smirking right there. He's happy that he got lucky enough to actually stay in that out of bounce section. Reacts to it very well and is going to be able to make his way up to that ramp. A bit of a risky looking ramp section from Nicro here, but he is actually going to go for the flashy strategy of just rolling along the railing to make up just a little bit of time. Another thing that Stravo's not going for here, trying to keep his woodeds as consistently as possible by the looks of it, is that spin pound out of the maze, just opting for a long jump instead. 
Now, messing up that particular tr strategy there would cost you quite a bit of time because looming underneath you is the deep woods that we were talking about earlier. The deep woods kind of a hidden section of the Wooded Kingdom that you have to kind of maneuver your way out. And these guys don't want to go in there at all. It would lose a lot of time. Micro getting the spin pound out of the maze right there. There's actually a strat that um, used to be done with a long jump instead. And these long, jump, long jumps in this game, I mean, we are going to be seeing SM64 later on where long jumps are a very useful tool. And don't get me wrong, long jumps are still useful in this game. They are not, like, if you can avoid them, you want to avoid them because when you are going fast in this game, a long jump will initially slow you down. Micro is going to be doing two of them right here to line up for the flower road skip that way and it's going to be getting that as well. So this is the actual position we are at right now. We just broke even with these route changes and we can actually see how much that mattered. Strava's entering the tower here at 16 minutes and 35 seconds. Let's see what Nick is going to be at getting into here, into this one. It looks like we are still looking at around these 10 seconds of difference, pretty much exactly. Yeah, it looks like Nicro, every time we check the time here, Nicro is making about a second's worth yeah, of ground. Pretty much. So, you know, the more often we check, if every five minutes or so, maybe we'll be seeing ourselves at a perfect sync pretty soon here. But yeah, it, it really just, just goes to show that playing consistently obviously does get you the results and kind of keeps you on pace, but it can be rather rewarding to go for some of the riskier things because you can make up those tiny little bits of time as long as you are confident with it. This last section of Wooded Kingdom coming up again, these last three moons. Back in the day, we were just fighting the boss. Nick is not even able to do that because he didn't get the Piranha Story Moon. It's going to get a stun lock right there. I brought up earlier how this can be happening if you're not meshing at the right time or like if you're not getting an AA input at the right time, you kind of want to buffer a jump to avoid this one. It's almost the time save close to like a bonk, um, but I mean, not the biggest deal. Just some minor frustrations on Nick's part there. Looks like he wasn't necessarily getting the, the nut open as soon as he wanted it to. But he is going to be following along Strav here into the pipeway room. And let's see here, Strav was very consistent usually at this flooding pipeway. Is going to be able to get the cycle just fine. No damage taken, no cycle missed. And is going to be off to uh, Cloud. And actually, looking at the timer right now, it looks like he's around three seconds behind Stra uh, Chaos's run earlier, who got like an 18-23 ending here to Wooded Kingdom, and he, Strabas was looking to get like a 26, um, which is quite amazing. So he right now doing very well, but Nick not too far behind. I'm assuming around 12 seconds after that stun lock, maybe 13. Yep. Um, so pretty close going into Cloud and then especially lost. Yeah, a 27 fade out, you know, and we have been kind of talking about Stravos not going for the absolute most optimal strategies, but still able to pull away with a very solid exit in this kingdom. So it just goes to show that consistency really does matter in this game, and the, the movement that you make, aside from the very flashy tricks, can still get you some very phenomenal times. All right, 18.50 for Nick. Uh, actually, that was the wrong failure I was looking at right there. Never mind. We, we, should, we should be looking at these like 12, 13 seconds. So uh, forget what I just said. But getting into Cloud Kingdom right now, and as you brought up earlier, this kingdom is relatively basic in terms of stuff. What we do, there's like three, sec three tricks. The first one being your movement to get to the platform. The second one being those Bowser manipulations where you make Bowser jump specific spaces. You want to ma only ma make him jump one space. What Stravos did right there by being in a posi uh, specific position. And then the last one being those fast head grabs with Strava's showed off all of them pretty nicely right there. Yeah, just a handful of very small and simple mechanics that kind of build themselves up into probably like making this fight a couple of seconds faster than if you were to just try it for yourself. <laughs> but Stravos oh. not getting the proper backflip timing on that third phase, That's... so he's going to have to redo it. Meaning he's just going to have to wait. That's the last phase too. That's the most punishing one to make a mistake. And so we'll actually see Nick potentially almost catch up right here. Stravos is going to be able to get that in time. He looked pretty surprised by this one. This is a mistake I rarely see him make. But we are going to be almost breaking even here at the end of Cloud. Just like that. About 10 seconds worth of mistakes made by Stravos just now brings them within only a couple. And now this is, if not the scariest kingdom, one of the scariest kingdoms lost bringing up again that this might actually be the most um, deciding factor of our playoff series. So these guys while getting here, it might have just because they made less mistakes and lost. I mean, Stravos' and Sui's series was really determined by Lost Kingdom. And Curbs also made some big mistakes here earlier. So we'll see how this kingdom will treat them today. Starting off with what we call the meme tree, Nicro getting that incredibly 
very swaggy strategy with the return cap throw in order to ma ma maintain and make sure that he does get that return jump, which is very crucial for making this strategy work. Butterfly is the quiet here by these guys, not opting for the very fast triple jump across the butterfly. Now Strauss is going to be getting a long jump over. Nick is going to be going for the spin pound into a roll cancel. So many inputs really quickly to maybe save a fraction of a second. But this is what this game really is about. Uh, if you want to play at the highest level, you definitely have to work your fingers. Nick approaching this from a kind of an awkward angle, but he was able to get the dive over the edge of the tree to avoid bonking and falling into the poison, so good on him for that. Both of these guys approaching this kind of awkwardly placed stair moon, for sure. and both having a little bit of difficulty just grabbing it from inside. Okay, as long as you get that right angle here to make that trapetal, which is Nintendo's name for this enemy, break that block and get the moon as fast as possible, you will be fine. But Stravos now approaching the triple jump towards that cage without control over Cappy. Is going to be able to get the triple jump off, gets a nice angle on the dive. The cage is broken and Nick is going to be able to do the same. Very Nick, nicely done. Nick right behind him. And both of these guys have an incredibly clean Lost Kingdom. Looks like Nitro's lines in most places were just a tiny bit cleaner from my perspective, oh. and it looks like he might just be saving just a tiny bit of time as a result. Stravos, though, with a little bit more optimal ending, he was doing... Um, we were talking about how you can cancel your rolls with cap throws, and he was actually doing that with a spin throw. So he could go from the very high speed into an instant spin throw, capturing, I guess, hitting that globe to finish up the kingdom. Nick played it safe with that long jump. Wouldn't matter much. But, um, yeah, pretty awesome here. Good Lost Kingdoms from both of them, which is very crucial when a race is that close. Now heading into Night Metro, which can, depending on the Wiggler RNG, already make them tight or like even change leads. Yep. Dealing with it and kind of figuring out what you need to do to defeat the Wiggler as fast as possible. Sometimes you just get the perfect pattern and can finish off the fight relatively quickly. So if Nick gets the perfect pattern and Strava struggles a little bit, that could be all it takes to bridge the gap here. And here we go. Metro Kingdom. Uh, Nick actually getting a very nice line right there, getting optimal triple jumps, able to get a spin throw. Stravos was doing that well himself, but it looked like Nick really spaced out these jumps perfectly as they are heading towards the uh, Gerda Sandwich Moon. Which is just a nicely placed moon along the way. Like we mentioned earlier, Night Metro doesn't really have enough moons for us to gather in order to leave the kingdom, but there are a couple on en route that make this kingdom quite fast that we will pick up before we kind of continue into the day portion. So that is one of them. And Nick actually going for the little Goomba bounce. They're almost falling down there. Going to be able to clutch it out. It's going to take a bonk. His line was kind of thrown off since he didn't get the rolls across he wanted. But he was actually going for this little Goomba bounce or Goomba jump towards the entry here. So we are still extremely close. Both of them able to get on the first cycle of the elevator as they make their way to the next moon in Metro, which is the lost and found City Hall moon here in that uh, chest. Just another moon nicely placed right in our optimal path. So we might as well pick it up while we're going. Strabo's almost getting sniped out of the air wow. by that by that fly. <laughs> I, I, I've still yet to see that, but I feel like it has to be possible. It has to be. I'm sure it's happened to someone somewhere that that fly just kind of snipes you out of the air. But yeah, as far as, as far as I've seen, I haven't actually seen it happen, but it has come very close a couple of times before. Strabo's with a very clean beginning to this Robo uh, Wiggler fight here. Sniping exactly the right spots to finish the fight in three shots, which is optimal. And he's going to be approaching the second phase first. And it is going to come down to this phase to see just how much time is going to be made up or lost on Micro's part here. Yeah, we are going to be seeing those patterns reveal here very shortly. First on Stravos' screen. And then we'll see if that might actually matter enough to... Because they are so close, we might see those leads break up just in this phase. But Travis tends to be very, very good at Mecha Wiggler. He, he usually reacts to this very well, a, a FPS player. And that actually shines through here specifically. Is going to be missing that last shot once, but doesn't matter too much. Let's see if Nick is going to be able to kind of match him. Actually, he's going to be blocked out by those fireballs. Misses one of these shots, has to snipe that up right now. Uh, actually takes a little bit to snipe it, but does get it. Not the most optimal two-cycle, but will be happy as long as he gets out of there. Displaying the reasons that this boss fight, aside from the RNG, can be very frustrating. You know, all of the hitboxes kind of do this weird collision detection thing over top of one another, so in order to get those last kind of shots in, sometimes you need to shoot in some very awkward places. 
and not directly at the glowing bubbles themselves. Yeah, good stuff though by both of them being very close here throughout that early and even start of mid game right now. Now heading into day metro, which most people consider Metro, Seaside, Snow and Luncheon to be the mid game of the run. So I guess we're already in it, but let's see if they can keep those close race, this close race up. Uh, now, Day Metro definitely has a ton of strategies where you can lose small amounts of time everywhere. And also keep in mind that Nick is going to be gifted those three 1.5 seconds um, off of not getting that Capitex on his first warp here. Yeah, and he's going to be very thankful for that, considering how close this race is. I don't like that Cap Frost spot. Stravos getting the very optimal yep. drive by Scooter Clip there. Unfortunately, Nicro not getting the capture warp that he was looking for. Has to exit the girder kind of the normal way. And that is going to set up for some weird taxi cycles. Ooh, especially with that miss on the scooter clip there. Going to have to back it up a little bit. Not too bad overall. We saw Curbs kind of make the same mistake earlier, but Nick actually had to do his backup on the opposite side that we usually do it on. So he wasn't really able to use the scooter efficiently anymore. We kind of like to use the scooter to drive across to that awning. He's not going to be able to do that. So this day metro already starting off with a little bit of flaw. Strauss has been playing this pretty solidly, and he's currently building his lead. Yeah, which is going to be very important going into the later portion of the game. As we enter what is called the MSSL portion, I find that that is not part of the game that you can really lose like huge, huge chunks of time. It's all about kind of playing consistently in order to maintain your pace. So I was now starting off with the collection of all of the musicians. I mean, it's not all of them. We only pick up two. And in the most technical world where you get all the strats you want, it's actually faster to grab two different moons from a subroom that is very finicky to actually play fast through. So nobody actually does that in real time yet. Uh, but maybe you want to be the, f the next uh, top runner. So uh, make sure um, to, to check that out. Uh, still, this game has yet to be pushed even further. But uh, I mean, these guys are taking it as far as it currently gets and still collecting those musician moons, which is totally fine. Now, Strauss is going to be getting that extra Cappy text right here as he's about to warp up to the City Hall. Uh, unless I missed him getting that in Wooded, but I doubt it. So we are probably going to see a mesh through that text here, and he does. There it is. So that's what Nick is not going to have to deal with after getting the bassist. So while that was just basically a blink of an eye, it will be quite apparent here when Nicro goes through that kind of warp himself that he will not have to sit through any text. And as soon as that map appears on the screen, he'll already be gone and on his way to the next place. Just like that. Very, very quick warp as well. You can almost control that one while the screen is still black as it's fading in, as long as you know how far to move your stick. And Nick is doing that pretty, pretty nicely. They are in this higher level of uh, Metro now, and I'm not talking about difficulty, I'm literally talking about physical height as we are on top of the buildings right now. This climb in particular, as Travis just did, can be pretty tricky. You kind of rely on either audio or visual cues, runners tend to do this differently depending on what their preferences are, but uh, making that one work nicely. It's going to be missing that bullseye moon right there, that one hidden in the cafe. Um, but that's just a little bit of a time loss. He has to basically back himself up and to then get that, uh, that ground pound immediately. Let's see if Nick is going to be able to snipe that one up. Going for the bullseye from above. And does look like he has a good line there. Now, if you are a casual playing this game, the kind of indicator, obviously there's no shiny spot on this, this one to tell you where the moon is. So if you're looking for this moon in particular, it is essentially all motion controls and you feel the vibration in your controller when you're really close. Yep. But these guys know, of course, off the top of their head where it exactly is and will have no problem getting it. So Now, Stravos looked to have a little bit of a shaky crowd room here, trying to jump over the top and missing a couple of his jumps, but not going to cost him too much. And I gotta admit, I actually haven't checked his coin count leaving this kingdom. I just saw Nick is actually at 105, so he is totally fine going into snow first. Um, I haven't really seen any specific amounts, uh, portions of the run where he might have missed a lot of coins, so we should be fine going into snow both, but Strav might know better than I currently do. So we'll see what he decides to do here on this uh, selection, and he just goes to snow, so he should be fine. Opting for snow means that he will probably have enough coins. Nicro also going to have enough coins just as long as he doesn't die. But again, there are a couple coins kind of sp sp spread out about the Snow Kingdom that you can gather along the way, so not a big deal there. And it will give these guys a little bit more of an accurate comparison as we continue through these next two kingdoms. 
And here we go, starting off Snowdown's Travels is actually only at 95 coins. He is making an effort to pick up those three, which he technically doesn't need. I, I think the optimal, most optimal line actually ignores these coins, but he should be totally fine. There's some coins on, on the uh, umbrella that he's jumping on um, in a little bit, and also some coins throughout the sub room, so he should be totally good to go as well. So we are going to stay close throughout that mid-game. Getting Captain Toad here, as we were talking about in the first race, Snow Kingdom is basically just trying to get out of it as fast as he possibly can with the very limited moon pool that is available to us. And so Captain Toad, chilling in his little igloo, we're just going to bust it open. He's probably going to die of frostbite later on, but that's okay. At least we get what we need and we can leave. Yeah, for sure. But Strauss is, is doing really well throughout this run so far. He has only made minor mistakes, really. Like one of the biggest ones we might might seen him, uh, we might have seen him is probably the one in Klaus, where he actually ended up not getting that head grab. But other than that, he has been playing super solid, um, all, uh, getting around the 30 exit, obviously for Metro. But Snow not only um, does it have this snow clip that uh, Strauss just got, it, it, it's it's just a minimal time save. It saves you around one second going through that wall using the moon clip mechanic instead of walking all around but if you get it you, you do want that now nick is not opting for this and it's arguably to say that ooh, Strava is also not getting the triple jump on your other screen on the right right there lots of things happening at the same time but actually not going for that snow clip can be viable since if you do miss it we always say it doesn't really lose time but it still does lose a little bit if you just go for that instant spin point when, when you're not really trusting yourself to get that clip that should still be better but uh, very close now in the end here of that blowy joy room as Strava had a little bit of issues getting up top yeah, Nick closing the gap just a little bit more as we progress through this snow and just the tiny little things starting to add up on Stravos' side. Now let's see here, going into that next sub room, Goomba room, something we haven't mentioned in that first race. There is actually just a tiny bit of RNG left in that room. The, the, the amount of RNG in this game is incredibly low for it, it, considering speed games. Like, you don't, you're not really relying on too much at all. This is all about movement, all about skill. Interesting camera there from Nick. He's kind of shaking his head. I'm not sure how he got that camera position. I, I, maybe he was like thinking he was in another room. Um, but that's fine. Uh, but yeah, these Goombas actually walk a little bit random, and the best way of approaching this room would be to take your two Goomba Goomba stack, activate the pillar first, and then have these Goombas run up to you. Kind of what Nick was doing right there. You want to start uh, making the pillar fall as early as possible. Didn't get the best line for these Goombas, but still fine. Th th you can probably, it can probably vary for, for around like a second, depending on how well the Goombas uh, move. Certainly, and how well you kind of balance and juggle them as well going back for them and then having to kind of catch up to the pillar is obviously not something you want to do either. Yeah, and Nick actually missing that roll cancel triple jump there on that ice. It's kind of tricky to cancel your roll on that uh, icy surface and you really want that, but ending up um, using a long jump instead, which is definitely slower, not a huge deal. Uh, what is a definitely a huge deal is the trick that we'll see on Strauss's screen soon as he's warping back to the Odyssey to uh, get a try at Snowdram. That is right, Snow Dram being this definitive trick. Now, we have said Dram probably a half a dozen or maybe True. even more times, but you know, coming from a perspective of somebody who doesn't run this game, they might not know exactly what Dram is all about. We will explain a little bit more after Stravos nice. accomplishes this trick. He gets it on the first try, Nick is going to be the second one to try. Now, there was this time when Nick used to struggle with this trick a lot when he was approaching these very low times, but he actually has a 100% consistency on this trick on his stat card. He's going for this very, very quick setup, actually pretty early rainbow spin, and I was about to say that that rainbow spin looked pretty early. It's going to take a bunk right there, and missing Snowdom actually loses you about 20 seconds not as much but very close yeah each attempt sends you all the way back you're not allowed to warp until you're touching the ground so you kind of have to do this fall of shame reset up and doesn't look like he got the vault that he wanted out of that snow dram as well so he's gonna have to set up again but Relatively early, but it's going to make it work. He's really pushing himself to go for this very quick setup of the camera. It's going to be able to make this work on his next attempt. But overall, with these misses he had right there, easily losing 25 seconds or more. So Stravos is now dealing with a pretty big lead. It's nothing unsurmountable for Nick, but he's going to be happy. Like Strav is going to be happy about this one. Heading into Seaside, which at some point of the time used to be called the Stravi Kingdom. The Stravi the kingdom side, where he, Yeah, fact. the Stravi side, actually. Yeah, a kingdom where he really pushed out all of these strategies to be fast in here when it comes 
comes to these jumps and also these lines. Uh, the only thing that he didn't really do uh, with this kingdom is like finding that out of bounds clip, which once again Circle did that, and Tuval, which you guys, if you watch Speedrun, you might know Tuval. He's a huge deal. He, he found like Gelato Beach Skip in Super Mario Sunshine. He, he, he did tons of things for this game. He's awesome. Uh, yeah, these two guys really pushing Seaside to the next level, but Straf being amazing at the kingdom. Yeah. Even though he didn't find the trick himself, Stravos was one of the pioneers of trying to optimize that movement. And we mentioned kind of before that Stravos was a runner who used to kind of have a reputation for being one of the ones to kind of go for all of the absolute fastest tricks. Has kind of settled himself down as a more consistent runner, but I think that, you know, Seaside, he still has a little bit of a kind of prideful spot on him for Seaside. So he still has a very, one of the best Seaside Kingdoms in Easily, yeah. in the run. I think he, he he is second in the world, and for, when it comes to individual levels, Curbs being the fastest for this kingdom now after this uh, route slightly changed. But yeah, so I was still understanding this kingdom really well. Now, this kingdom technically is one of the least risky ones. I guess the biggest risk would be clipping back in, Nick getting an unfortunate bunk right there, but all of the mistakes that you will be making here won't really kill you. It's really hard to ac actually die in this kingdom other than drowning or like intentionally taking damage. There's almost no way to die um, as Mario, so that shouldn't be the biggest deal. But uh, exactly that's, the, that's why you want to play as optimal as possible, because it should on paper be so easy. It's all about those lines, all about those... I mean, the, the first jumps are pretty tricky, but especially underwater, you just want to move straight. That's right. And the second part of this kingdom being mostly underwater, using this fish to swim kind of really quickly through. But Stravos is going to be the first to approach this clip that we saw earlier. and going to be getting it just fine and cannot understate how important it is that we do not clip back in bounds here. Ooh, that looks pretty close to the wall, but as long as he's holding right right there, he should be fine. He's going to be able to keep his line, stay out of bounds, entering that swing room and gets that one. He's going to be able to walk back, heading into luncheon because these guys both went to snow first. Uh, Nick is only going to have to do his boundary manipulation himself to be able to clip into that swing room. And then we should look at a luncheon that will definitely be pretty hot, no pun intended, as uh, this is still a close race and luncheon, especially the turnip clip section, has uh, done big things to paces. Like, they, it has been destroying people, to say the least. Yep. Countless, countless world record runs have gotten to luncheon, which is about three quarters of the way into the game, and then just completely been decimated. And in fact, some, some runners still kind of continue those runs and are able to pull off PBs where they have seconds, like literal dozens of seconds to save in luncheon kingdom by itself. It just is one of those kingdoms that can either make or break the entire thing. Absolutely. We are making our way there right now. Um, Straf already traveling there, is about to start things up as Nick is still banking in his moons in Seaside. And yeah, I brought up earlier, this first jump in particular has still um, caused some issues for speedrunners. Straf was actually going for a normal cap stall against this wall. I've seen many runners now opt for a up throw instead, which kind of allows you to turn a bit more smoothly other than that cap throw. Um, and this is some pretty technical stuff. This, this game, as we brought up earlier, all of these movements are super technical. So we really like to nerd out, out about these small differences because they actually do really matter. If you run this game, you'll mention, you'll realize that sometimes an up throw over a normal cap throw will do wonders. Yep. And if you're looking to be more consistent, sometimes that's really all it takes is just changing a particular element of your movement. Now, Stravos is fighting Spirit right here, and he's getting insanely clean hits. He's always really like mentioning how he thinks he really understands these boss fights well. He understands these timings well, which is also the reason why he's able to get so like really great lake times even without going for that lake clip, because he just really understands those timings. Um, we were mentioning earlier the, the good topper. Or, um, I mean, Spirit as well, he just knows his timings there. Um, which is something we haven't really touched on. The way we, spy, we fight Spirit here is obviously, uh, as he's getting back into position right here, he is actually not hittable, so we wait until a specific moment to kind of let Kevin return to us, taking off his head. Yep. And there's kind of two phases to each of these hits. You have to remove his hat, which is, of course, like a kind of a symbol of protection in this game. You remove the hat by that homing of Cappy back in, and then you jump on his head to deal the damage. 
But actually, I was able to get a little bit of a glimpse there of our chat. And a very interesting fact is that Nigro, in his, I guess, GSA career, has actually not been beaten. That's true, actually. He, he, he went through playoffs 4-0, and oh, and his entire league like league career, he has never been beaten. So Strauss is looking to maybe be the first in a GSA setting. There were a couple of close chances in the actual regular season, and you know some unfortunate circumstances did lead to Nitro still coming out on top. But that definitely doesn't understate just how, again, consistent Nitro is in competitive play. Yeah, for sure. Strabos once again going for that intentional bonk, grabbing that moon at that optimal position, is going to be backflipping across now. And yeah, this section, once again, it's really interesting to watch this one. Let's see how Strabos is approaching this. He is going to be going for another spin pound roll cancel, and he gets the angle right. He is able to kind of speed across that, that little assault aisle, and that allows you to get the potable in the most optimal position, potable being those lava bubbles. The lower the potable is, the quicker you can move, because if you capture it very high, it will at first straight fall down back into the lava, and he manages to get that optimally. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of that kind of minor optimization in this kingdom. It's part of the reason why all of these runners are bonking against the pot, because if you want to kind of hit the ground so that you can continue your momentum, you can continue your movement. So the closer you are to the ground, the faster you're able to jump away. So even though we are talking of differences of probably like 0.1 of a second, if you add all of those up over the entire course of the run, you can be saving quite a bit of time. Like we're not going to be able to get that angle just right. He has to do a dive at the very end. Actually bonking into the lava right there. As long as he throws Cappy, he is at least going to save himself from really taking any serious damage. But that makes him miss that potable cycle. He's going to have to wait for the potable to circle around the island and probably losing up to five seconds because he also got a damage refill there. Yeah, uh, which actually we haven't talked about yet, Dangerous. Maybe you can explain the damage refills uh, as Strabus is doing his turnip clip. That's right. Something we haven't really touched on throughout this race. Not a whole lot of damage being taken, but every time you take damage and then collect a moon immediately afterwards, the game kind of refills your health in that moment. There are a couple of exceptions, any multi-moons you collect will, will completely skip that animation and not lose you any time, so if you lose damage in a boss fight, it's not a big deal, but of course if you're taking damage before every single moon, you're losing two seconds every single time. And Strauss is playing really incredible. He just got a very, very solid turn and clip. And if anyone really deserves to take that first one of Nigro, it's this run right now. He's been playing so well, and he's looking to do the same. Turn and clip being one of the not the last like major gl uh, trick that we do. I guess it's, I guess it's the last major glitch, but I'm not even going to get into that because people tend to disagree about what a glitch is and what isn't. So let's not even talk about that. But Nick also getting a very solid position there on that turnip. Actually, this is actually four out of four so far. Everybody has actually gotten an instant turnip clip. Absolutely in insane today. Yep. That's really hard to do. Excellent performance from these guys. It's a very awkward trick if you've ever tried it yourself at home. It definitely goes against kind of the, the regular movement of the game and really makes you kind of think outside the box. Now, you see that all of these guys are clipping on the left side of the cage, and that's because the right side just doesn't seem to work. It's one of the weird quirks of how this trick works. Yeah, we actually don't fully understand that at this point. We are glad that it does work because the intended strat for this moon is actually pa uh, capturing one of these pan bros and then throw pans against these huge cheese blocks, and that is... Sometimes you feel robbed there because uh, it's super random how these pants are actually flying. So good stuff that we actually have that clip to help us out there. Yeah, it's almost less frustrating to just try and do the clip itself than go for the intended strategy there. For sure. Clean movement from both of these guys, finishing up Luncheon Kingdom on their way to Ruined at about the same time. It does look like Stravos has about a 30 or 40 second lead here though going in. And since there wasn't really that much time to do like a get together yet, dangerous, we haven't really been preparing too many of these ruined trash talk segments. I think we gotta lap some out That's today, true. really prepare some topics for you guys to like get through ruined. Because I mean, if you are new to the speed game right now, it, it'll be exciting to watch how these guys really perfection like that fight, how they really like lap that out. But once you see like the fourth or like the fifth game, it's like. Whatever, they hit him on the head. So Dangerous and I will be doing some prep work there to keep you entertained. Yep. We just obviously all met yesterday. So uh, we gotta uh, push through Ruin for now. But I mean, we can still appreciate how well Strauss' run is going right now, since he's already in the arena right now. Again, if you take Ruined and you take Bowser's and you take Moon, put them together, we're looking at about 20, wait, what is this? Probably like 18-ish uh, minutes, 18 to 19 minutes to the end of the game. So, these guys still on incredible pace. Okay, 
Well, let's see, obviously, going for early damage boosts here to make it on top of the Dragon's Head. And he's actually, this is a pretty big deal. He missed his cap for twice. <laughs> he looked super surprised there. Cappy not really cooperating because sometimes, um, and as a speedrunner, you know the feel, Cappy just decides to completely disregard your motion control and just doesn't home anywhere. Because if Cappy is thrown out, you can actually shake your controller to make it home into like the next target. But look like Cappy didn't feel like doing it for Strav. Yeah, sometimes this game gives weird priority to what Cappy likes. If there are any coins around a capture that you want, Cappy will almost always go for the coins, which of course is not what you want at all. So I'm not sure what Cappy was going for this time in particular, but you know, as a speedrunner of this game, I can definitely say that Cappy does not work in your favor sometimes. Nick also on that first phase of the dragon right now, Strav already in that third one. Really kind of signifying that his lead definitely grew. We are looking at less of a lead than what Chaos had over Curbs earlier, and Bowser's Kingdom, especially with a fall uh, uh, at Mech, can pretty much eradicate that. But uh, let's not hope that it's happening. We have also seen Strauss make some unfortunate mistakes at the end of Moon recently, um, which we will, we will, I think, over the course of this event, we will see what mistakes are likely to happen to these guys. Uh, but we're obviously wishing for them to get the best times possible. Uh, Chaos starting this one off with a 100. Uh, I mean, one hour, zero minutes and 23 seconds has definitely got a... He, he set the bar very high for this event. Certainly. And, you know, just on an average perspective, Nicrovita coming in with the best average time, but trying to compete with something that is of such a, a caliber as a, a 10020 in the very first race in front of people like this, you know, that is a force to be reckoned with. Good stuff, though, by both of them, being able to feed the dragon just fine. Strava's having a little bit of issues in his first phase, as Cappy wasn't really cooperating. But now going into BM, or Bowser's and Moon, which are these uh, last two games. We kind of like to split it right there, since you mentioned earlier how ruined is this break. And then it's time for BM, That's Bowser's right. Moon, to kind of finish these last kingdoms. And, I mean, they tend to be quite hard. And at an optimal level, you're looking at something like just under 13 minutes. So going by that, Stravos is on pace, potentially to still get a 100 time. Necrovita not far behind, probably only about 45 seconds. Yeah, both of them, um, I mean, especially Strauss here, able to beat his average time. We looked at that earlier being like a 10, uh, definitely a 101. Um, if I remember correctly, it might have been like a 101 3x, yeah. being one, one, one hour, one minute, and around 30 seconds. So he is on pace to beat his average, still improving, um, which is what you want in an event like this. You want to be pushing yourself to get those better times. But let's look at Bowser's kingdom. Once again, being this kingdom is kind of segmented in these different islands. The second island being, actually this is technically the third island, being home of the ogre. Strava is actually bonking twice, that might make the ogre uh, be unhittable for a little while. Is going to be able to back it up after he uh, basically put the stamp down for a second time, but it's certainly a little bit of a time loss. And he, he, he seems a little bit confused about this one, since this rarely ha happens. Some very visible frustration there with the ogre from Stravos. Going to give Nicro just a little bit of time to catch up. But as we approach Bowser's Kingdom, these little things are going to start to add up. All right, let's see if Nicro is going to be able to kind of abuse that because, I mean, he has the chance to save time, but will he? Once again, Ogre probably being one of the least, uh, le less um, usual time losses. As long as you time your spin point right, you will get that. Nicro playing that very well, gets a quick hit on, uh, on top of him and is certainly making up some time here. Stravos going into one of the most difficult parts of the run, and you're seeing here why. Going for that dive back shard strategy and actually taking a bonk on the wall, getting bullied by the spinies, and like we mentioned earlier, that is going to result in even more time loss later on, having to refill his damage. And all of these things are going to start to add up as we progress. If Nicro has a cleaner shards um, section here, he can definitely make up some time. And I hope he can keep and stay uh, he keep his calm and stay collected because uh, so far he has been having um, he, he had a, a pretty big quote unquote big mistake on all of these story moon sections. The first one being missing that ogre entirely, missing the shard, taking damage off the spine. And even though this is a story moon, you will still get that damage refill. You see it uh, happen here very shortly. Those multi moons, for example, the triple moons, they won't refill your health. Like we're not getting the cap where you wanted right there, but getting a pretty decent backup. But uh, on the story moons, you will still get that refill animation that you were talking about earlier in, in Luncheon Kingdom. Does this only gets cut out on, on multi-moons. 
Travos a little bit visibly confused there. Didn't get the capture warp, the Bowser Dram, as we call it, um, in a way that he was expecting. So I had to actually just go back and capture manually there. But here we are at the proverbial fork in the bosses here, seeing Stravos going for Harriet first. Uh-oh, that's two and one for Harriet first. I feel like Chaos might be the only representative of the top of first gang here at pace. We might have to see. Maybe, you just never know, these runners might be cheeky, they might change it up on us a little bit. But, um, you know, as far as it is pace official, I should say, Looks like Harriet first is the way to go. Yeah, I feel like uh, you guys gotta definitely incentivize these uh, these boys on Twitter or something to ask them if they could represent your favorite boss uh, gang there to maybe change the fate of this one. But currently, Harriet definitely being uh, the favorite. Yep, three one result from these runners. Harriet first. And let's see how these fights go in general. We obviously, actually haven't been able to talk about this. Um, and actually, it looks like Nycro wasn't doing it there, but there is this first-person strategy for this Harriet fight that we actually haven't explained yet. Uh, he is doing it right now, setting up in a way that he can throw Cappy out a little bit earlier. It's going to be actually missing this one. Um, you, you, you kind of go into first-person that you set up Mario's angle in a way that all you need to do is jump and throw Cappy instead of jumping to the side, allowing you to hit Harriet a little bit earlier. Missing this on this one as I was about to explain it. That's rude. That is rude. How, how dare they, honestly. But Nycro still having to go through Topper, which is the shorter of the two boss fights. Harriet kind of has her way of jumping around, which you cannot really interrupt. Topper's faces, you can really interrupt. You kind of bounce on him as quick as possible to make those shorter. Yeah, mimicking the very first boss fight, except with a lot more hats involved. So no real quick strats available to us, quite the same. But we're going to finish him up just fine. Now, Stravos just has this final platforming section of Bowser's Kingdom, including a very long wall climb to get up to the Robo Brutal and probably the definitive moment of Bowser's Kingdom, this boss fight coming up. Yeah, for sure. Still having to climb up to actually gain access to the mech fight. This specific climb here with the Pokio is um, pretty tough. Um, you actually want to kind of kind of move to the left a little bit to be able to skip that accordingly. Um, basically shake as little as possible. And Nick is actually going to take a dive down here. One of the most unfortunate mistakes to make in not grabbing those crate moons, uh, those crates, and uh, definitely losing a big chunk of time there. Getting his cap throw a little bit too close to the wall, and Cappy just did not respond the way that he wanted, and he's going to suffer quite a bit of time as a result. Now let's see mech fight here for Strahov. This is going to be pretty, pretty big. Gets a decent climb and is able to hit the mech, uh, the, the, the topper bubble just fine. But these last two hits still matter a little bit more. Um, it is technically the worst phase to fall down is the second bubble, but this is the most likely to fall down because whenever your inputs are slow, when you don't get that spin point in time, you will not get that strat. So let's see if Strahov's fingers are warm, gets the first spin point just fine. Is going to be setting up for the target acquired. And let's see if he can get this one. Quick dive, quick spin pound, target, target acquired. acquired. Nick going to be following suit. He is a full Robo Brutal fight behind now, so it's going to be really down to the wire to make sure that he is able to get this fight as fast as possible in order to keep pace. And it's going to be very important going into Moon Kingdom because while we only have about five and a half minutes left, anything is still possible. And if Stravos makes a huge mistake in Moon Kingdom, it can lose quite a lot of time. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if Nick is also going to be able to get those target acquired threats at the very end, because we have been talking about how Stravos actually, in one of his playoff matches, actually made this huge mistake of a fall. It might have been one of the last league matches as well, where he took a huge fall on that, on that moon cave skip, probably losing him easily more than a minute, which is around the time that he's currently leading by. So I'm not calling this one over, but Nick needs to get that threat to stay in. Well-timed dives there. Good Robo Brutal fight from Nick, and he's gonna 
Target acquired. Target acquired for sure from him there. And uh, is also going to be making his way over to Moon. Uh, Strava's already banking in his moons into that globe. Nick is going to have to sit through these multiple seconds of cutscenes where the Brutus kind of explode. Um, they actually debate you again, though, because these guys never die. Nope. They'll always be chilling on the dark side of the moon, and they'll never leave. You actually can't defeat them. Yep, they're just waiting there, you know, kind of playing into this Japanese mythology about where rabbits come from, I suppose. There is kind of a hidden dungeon and a, a hidden boss rush waiting in the post game of this game. So if what you guys see here is essentially the main storyline, but this game does have quite a lot more to offer. If you guys are interested in speedrunning in general, there are quite a few different categories available in this game, One inclu including one that is up to eight hours long as a result of getting absolutely every moon that there is. So while this is the fastest category, um, I, I feel like Odyssey has a lot to offer in yeah, terms of a speed sure. game, especially when it gets to kind of the post-game content. I think you actually do like the dark side of the moon on your stream, for example, right? I do, yeah. That's yeah. one of my favorite categories to run as of late. Um, it gives you just a little baby portion of the post game, and then you get to go right into the dark side where you do these refights, including one with this Robo Brutal, and finish off after 250 moons of collection. Yeah. This game really having a huge variety of speedrunning stuff to offer, but this is the most optimized category these guys have been pushing. They are arguably the hardest this category was looked at the most. I think this is kind of natural. People wanted to push this game under an hour, but we'll see what the future holds for us. Uh, any percent is still exciting, though. Even though the record is at 59 minutes and 57 seconds, we have ways to go. We all know right now that technically a 59 minutes and 40-something seconds run is on the table whenever someone really uh, pushes it further. We, we know it's possible, it is going to happen at some point, and any percent will probably never die, even though people like to say that. It's, it's just not true. It, it can go so, so many different ways. But let's see, Strauss is not taking an unfortunate fall here on Moon Cave Skip this time. Is opening the final door here to Bowser, uh, to the second Bowser fight, and after that is only going to be um, going through that escape section to look, uh, looking, looking good here um, to, to finish off this first race strong. Yep, very clean first section of Moon Kingdom. No problem with the Moon Cave skip on his way into the Cathedral and now facing Bowser for the second time. And while this is kind of the second chunk of the Moon Kingdom, it's very hard to die here. I'd be very surprised if we saw any runners do that, but of course, knock on wood, no commentator's curse here, hopefully coming into play. An interesting element is that, you know, we talk about commentators' curses as kind of a joke, but in a situation like this, the commentators are actually part of the experience. The runners are not on a delay. They can hear exactly everything we're saying. So it is very possible that commentators' curse might actually exist in a live setting. True. That, this is the most likely um, place to, for a commentator's curse to actually happen, even though we have, we have almost experienced these, these scenarios before, even in an online setting That's where right. we said things that were unlikely to happen. I remember actually that invisible wall on oh this final goodness. room being kind of summoned by your words, it felt <laughs> like. So that's still a possibility. But let's forget about this and let's wait with all curses until they actually finish as Stravos is now in the last phase of Bowser Fight 2. Nick just started it up, both of them getting those fast head grabs. Yeah, a very similar situation with just how close these races can be. Both of these guys in that final fight together. Nitro just two phases behind. And now down to Stravos to kind of pull this one home. Just has the escape sequence, like we mentioned before. Two relatively tricky parts to kind of maneuver through. The first one being that 2D section and getting that optimal skip. The second one being the pillar room and trying to break open that first one as optimally as possible. But aside from that, Stravos is running away with this. And there we go, escape section now. Stravos is going to, and you mentioned earlier how he's actually hitting the bridge. There's a pretty tricky, at, at first, triple jump that these guys actually space out because Bowser can triple jump. You want to space out your jump in a way to skip that section. Usually the game intends you to walk around before you get to this bridge. But yeah, even things like the escape are figured uh, out and optimized. Now, most interestingly enough, this specific section here, the 2D section, while having that 2D skip, for the longest time we didn't know that Bowser can actually run here. We found that out like way too late. There was like such a weird moment once we realized, oh, wait, you can f shoot fireballs with X and you can hold Y at the same time to run? That's what? right. It's kind <laughs> of like a Super Mario Bros. 1 mechanic where the button does two things, but we just never kind of had the intuition to believe that until somebody tried it. 
we have been figuring out that one now, obviously helping us a little further. But Strauss is heading into pillar room right now, and as long as he's not falling right here, he is going to be the first one to take a game off of Nick right now. Um, is going to be moving across here towards that first pillar. All that could really happen to him is a fall right here, which would actually send him back to the very start of the escape section. Might not get that early pillar, but gets the shot, these shots in right there. I think it broke. I think I did see it go. So even though it took a couple extra shots, he is going to get that first pillar down, which is going to save a little bit of time of going around. Nick going to be the second to approach the 2D skip here. And this is looking very good now. Only this last pillar to be falling. Strava's getting those shots in. This last one should be enough to make it fall. Running towards the center right here, clawing onto this final brick. And I'm not sure if he can still get that one all time. It might be barely out of reach, or maybe he just barely still got it. Uh, he actually will still get it. Yep, looks, think, looks good. I think this might be a 59. I think he's just barely going to squeeze that <laughs> one. Look at Strava's. He's, yep. Oh, okay. I mean, I, he, he was a little bit criti critic right there. I'm not sure if it was a 59 or a 101 flat, but I think he's happy with this one for sure, getting the first win here off of Nick. But Nick also pretty close to him, just entered pillar room, so he will still be getting, as long as he plays this section well, a, a decent chunk of points. Absolutely. And just as a reminder, every 10 seconds that Nicro loses by is one more extra point towards Stravos. So finishing within 10 seconds would mean that Nicro would still walk away with 30 points, but it is going down as he finishes this final chunk of the game. And he is still going to be coming in at a 101 time. Yeah, le less, th less than a minute of difference here for Nick. So that's still very, very solid by him. It's going to be getting a decent chunk of points here. We are looking at around... Um, we're looking at around 22 points, 23 points here for Nick. We are going to be doing that math or whatever. But good stuff here. Uh, 101, 53, 101 flat by Strav. Strav taking that win off of Nick. Good stuff. Seeing the handshakes right here. This is what I want to see. Great stuff by them. And this was the second race here, Strav versus Nick. I can't wait what this event still has to offer for us, Dangers. I cannot wait myself either. This event still has a couple days left to go. And... You know, very interesting to see how it's kind of unfolded at the beginning. Yeah, sure. and very consistent stuff from these guys. I was not expecting these 100s to come flying out of the gate with all of the pressure that is on. And, you know, it's it's interesting to see how these guys react in a situation like this. I, was, I feel like the face cam is adding so much value to what we're actually doing right there. Like, it's so Certainly. interesting to see if that like actually mentally affects them or if they're just, like, law thing it off. It's, it's definitely going to be worth, like, really looking at that and see what that does to them. But good stuff. Uh, Straw was actually the first one to beat Nick in a GSA setting. Yep. He's going to be playing Chaos tomorrow, and Kerb is actually playing Nick. Against so that's Nick, be so it'll, it'll be basically be winners versus losers. Chaos coming out ahead at the, uh, the, the first day of this here pace event. So, um, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, we are going to forego interviews for this match just to catch up a little bit on our time. Coming up right after this is some Super Mario 64 70 star league action between the top four and you want to catch that for sure so make sure to stay tuned throughout that setup section as we head into a little bit of our intermission and see you guys tomorrow for the next odyssey take care